Big time, record breaking. Uh, that's what describes this week on uh, the Penn State Hoops show because Penn State basketball played in a, an electric big time game early in the week and then set some records late in the week. Nate Bauer, he's going to break it all down. The premier basketball insider on the Hoops show. Welcome to the Penn State Hoop Show. I'm T. Frank. That's Nate Bauer. Nate, do, do you like you're you're kind of an aw shucks guy. Like you kind of have this perpetual sort of like you're very humble. Do you like it when I pump you up as basketball insider reporter extraordinaire, Nate Bauer? Uh, uh, it gives me good? pause. Yeah, it gives me pause. I, I'm not going to say that I don't appreciate some level of recognition for paying attention to Penn State basketball. But yeah, no, it's you don't have to say that. Well, it's true. I mean, I would not say it if it weren't true. Uh, the, the number one thing about selling is believe in what you're selling. And I believe in, in you. I believe in the show. I'm glad we're here today after an up and down, busy, topsy-turvy, headline-making week. You yeah. are the center of all of it. So yeah. tell me, uh, let's start with the Plester game. Let's get, let's yeah. get into that. You were there. You talked yeah. about the atmosphere and what to expect. Was it what you expected? Yeah, let's let's call it a, a down and up week for Penn State basketball. Nice. Uh, right. The the Palestra game, uh, Penn State obviously host hosting really the number one team in the country and Purdue out in Philadelphia. And it was it was everything that Penn State could have hoped that it would be right. It, I, I mean, genuinely, the crowd, the atmosphere, the anticipation, it was a who's who of kind of Penn state people, right? Everybody was there. Uh, Pat Kraft was there. Calvin Booth was there. His son, Kerry was there. Uh, Board of trustees members, uh, you, you know, you kind of name it. And a lot of Penn state, even uh, Anthony Poindexter and Jaywan Sider were there. So like, it was just sitting courtside. Uh, and I'm sure for anybody else. Who, it's like a Lakers yeah. game. It's it, it, just, it literally you, was famous yeah. people, but in Philadelphia. Correct. Correct. So a ton of people, were there uh and you know really <laughs> it was a an elect <laughs> Stella's not good at this. Uh no. she loves you is the problem and every time she hears your voice she has to think of a reason to come see you. I know. That's what I figured was going to happen. Here's the question is do you want to yeah. do like a countdown and just restart? Uh -huh. Or do this tomorrow. Uh, let's do a countdown and restart. And uh, do you remember what you like, were saying? Uh, yeah, that it was a who's who for yeah Penn State so, basketball. We'll start. I'll start with my line then about the like being a Lakers game. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, give me so. one. Give me one second. Let me get her her water. Yep. <clears throat> no more. Don't come over there. Yeah, but you're not listening to me. Keep coming over. Here you go. Here's your water. Here's your water. Here are your puffs. <clears throat> Touch the TV. Hey, no, keep him away from the TV. Go sit. Sit, Ollie. Okay, one more try. If they, if they, if they like go nuts yeah. again, uh, we'll just bag it for tomorrow. Yeah. If that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, because we're putting uh, the, ideally the audio comes out today, but we're putting the show out on Saturday so that, you know, we've got some, we've got some leeway time here. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> okay. Um, 
three, two. So what what you're saying is like it, it sounds like it's like a Lakers game, but in Philadelphia. Uh, it was very much that. It was everyone who has something to do with Penn State uh, in a big way uh, just seemed to be there at this game. There was a ton of anticipation and very clearly a ton of Penn State fans. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the one thing that I would say is just for anybody who's been to a whiteout football game and feels that surge when the when something happens and the crowd, you can like feel that pulsing. Uh, and certainly the, like the noise level, the decibel level, it, it, it is all of that. It is all of that yeah. because it's such a small space. It's such, such a small space and you, you pack 8,700 people in there. Uh, it just, it feels larger than life. Uh, and, and they had that, right? For the first half of that game, Penn State yeah. basketball was able to elicit so many of those moments. I mean, they hung right with them. 37-31 yeah. in the first half, Penn State's up six points. Uh, you know, Zach Eady was kind of getting his, but it wasn't as though Purdue was just doing anything that they wanted. And yeah. Penn State was making some spectacular plays along the way. So it was it was really set up to be uh, a showdown you know, in the second half, a, right? A showdown in the second half and an opportunity yeah. for Penn State. Uh, so what was the difference? Because it, it did not happen that way. And I think the basic kind of response is well Penn State stopped shooting as effectively but there's more that goes into it right yeah yeah no I think it was it was a combination of factors right it, it they did not shoot well Andrew Funk could not get loose Andrew Funk could not find his shot yeah uh Jalen Pickett really went off in the first half and just they bottled him up in the second half uh yeah. so, so the offense really just was not able to kind of click the way that it wanted to and I think defensively Penn State just had no real answer for Zach Eady. Like that, yeah. that was the thing that was overwhelming. It, yeah. It's important to contextualize this and say like Purdue, like really beat Penn state up in the second half. Like they were yeah. a, the much better team in the second half Penn state, you know, was able to do enough things to seem uh, very competitive in the first half, but uh, in the second half, in the second half, they just they just didn't have those same elements, and it really showed. Yeah, and and it was going to have to be a perfect game, right? It was going to have to be a situation where Penn State was playing its best, and in, in the second half, when when complimentary guys for uh, the Boilermakers are going off, like yeah, you're not going to be able to contend with two things. You knew Edie was going to get a lot of points. You knew that there was right. going to be an answer there, but right. when things started to lapse other places, that, that's where it kind of snowballed from my perspective. Yeah, no, I think I think that's definitely the case. And and when you're when you're stagnant offensively, which is something that happened, and you know we're going to touch on it here in a minute. Uh, when you're stagnant offensively and have no answers for what they're doing on the other end of the floor, uh, it just it, it just was too much. And and you know it it kind of went from uh, a six point game in Penn State's favor to a ten point game in Purdue's favor, really in not not that much time right i yeah. mean purdue was really yeah. able to wipe away that lead immediately out of the gates in the second half and it just never it just never felt competitive from there on out uh I, i'm the two games are kind of blurring together along with the michigan game Turn, yeah. turnover turnovers an issue in this game as well uh, uh because it felt like there was there wasn't a lot of consistency from penn state which i think we've touched on but um penn state a lot of unforced errors it felt like you you had like i said you had to play a very good game they were and then things kind of shifted. Yeah, I don't I don't know if turnovers were like a huge problem. I mean, they finished with nine. That's that's a, a hair above, I think, mm -hmm. where they, they like to be. Certainly they like to be in that uh like six to eight kind of range. So okay. a, so a little no. a little bit, but <laughs> but also um you know, Purdue Purdue just got what it wanted. Right? Yeah, Purdue just got what it wanted. It was it wasn't as though it was like this. Uh, dominating in transition everything is out of control it was very much a, a matter of uh Penn State just couldn't shoot they just didn't shoot the ball very well in the second half and uh a, a part of that a big factor was the fact that Michael Shrewsbury talked about it after the game yeah. that they felt as though the officiating in a way took them out of what they wanted to do completely mm -hmm. Right. There, there are things that they are looking for from officiating crews in terms of like how Penn State plays basketball, the style of basketball that they play. And uh, I asked him about it. We play so different. 
than a lot of other people in the league, right? So the fouls I'm asking for are different, right? Like Matt Painter's asking for fouls in the post on Zach Eadie's post up before he catches the ball, after he catches the ball, things like that. I'm asking for fouls on the perimeter, right? We're trying to post. Jalen Pickett's getting into the post and he's scoring a lot. He's not getting the fouls he deserves. <laughs> he's getting fouled. Like dudes are jumping on him, they're wrapping him around, they're making it hard for him to throw on the post. Gotcha. But like on the perimeter, we cut, we move everything else. And if you can put your hands on us, you slow us down, you take away what we want to do. So like understand that. Right? Like come into the game and study that and know, like, oh, this is how Penn State plays. This is how Purdue plays. This is what they're looking for. This is what they're looking for. And maybe they do, right? But they are good officials. But like, I don't know. I'm frustrated. So is it style of officiating? Like guys look for certain things and they're maybe more keyed into fouls in the post where it's congested and guys are getting their hands in totally. or, or is it more about something else? I think, I think it's that is a lot of the conversation that we're having this season is how is Penn state possibly going to match up against these bigs. Right. Right. And Zach, he didn't get to the free throw line either. And he takes a ton of free throws. So I, I think that the notion that it was a poorly officiated game in the first place, that there were more fouls by a wide margin than what yeah. were actually called it is, is warranted. It's valid. Right. I mean, they just more or less said, Hey, we're going to let you play. Um, yeah. There were some yeah. things that were inconsistent from the first half to the second half, some fouls that were called on Penn state early in the second half that I think really rubbed them uh, the wrong way. But overall it's, Hey, he, he's not uh, Jalen Pickett's in the post constantly. Yes. Michael, Sh Michael Shrewsbury is not looking for him to get those fouls. Now he's being fouled and he belongs at the free throw line. There are there. There's a reason for that. But yeah. the bigger, the bigger thing that hurts Penn state is, when guys, uh, when opponents are, are tugging at Andrew Funk's shirt or Seth Lundy's shirt right, and, and slowing them down on all of the perimeter action that they're trying to run, which you see, right? Like, I mean, we've, we've come to identify this. We know what this Penn State offense is supposed to look like in year two of Micah Shrewsbury. It just, it can't happen when those right. things are, are occurring really every trip down the court. So... Yeah. The fact that Purdue was able to do that, I, I just think it totally took them out of their rhythm. Um, and and the fact that the, the officials called not like defenses it's, will change their approach. Defenses will change what their habits are if they're yeah. racking up touch fouls. Uh, right. And that just didn't happen. So it, it's kind of like it's style of officiating is funny because your officiating should be officiating, right? But like we like I said before, certain officials seem to call one thing more than the other. So because it was a kind of a gritty game that did not work to Penn State's movement and efficiency and ball movement and screens and things like that. So as much as the mismatch was from Purdue, the mismatch was with the officiating crew, it sounds like, is kind of the picture we're painting here. A, a little bit, right? Like that's the important thing to to note here is right. a little bit. It, it was a factor. It, 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 there were, uh, right? What's James Franklin's line? It's everything, <laughs> right? Is is it was Penn State not playing defense at the level that it needed to. It was Penn State's offense not helping itself by uh, being stagnant and really crowding the floor. Uh, Mike Shrewsbury talked about it on Wednesday night after the Indiana game. They, they just, they didn't move. And so it's, it, you're watching your teammates uh, dribble the ball basically. And when there's no action around them, it just, the ball sticks, the ball sticks yep. and, and they're not yep. doing any of the things that they like to do. So, so yes, those things combined with the officiating the way that it was. And certainly you know, Mike, Michael Shrewsbury's point of, Hey, they're expecting one thing because this is big 10 basketball and we're something else. Right. I, I think it was a good one. And I think it was one. Ultimately we can get to this later carried through it. Right. It, like the, me the message resonated the, the, the crew that, that worked the Indiana game on Wednesday night. I'm sure that they were aware of it. I'm sure Micah Shrewsbury, even though he said he didn't, on Monday, I'm sure at some point he heard from the league office. I'm sh right. I'm sure that there was a back and That's forth there. I don't, be my I don't know what the fine was. Like, yeah. Is there a fine? Did did he reach into his pocketbook to make that point? I, I would be surprised if there wasn't. And I would mm -hmm. say it's the best money that he's spent this year if he did. Yeah.
Uh, but that wasn't the only thing he had to say, uh, you know, because there was a lot of stuff. And by the way, if you want to check that out, Nate is going to these press conferences and, and getting this this audio that you can re- hear for yourself. Check it out, bluewhiteillustrated.com. If you're watching the Hoops podcast, we're trying to grow this show on YouTube. We uh, have an insanely awesome out-of-the-gate group of people that love the show on our podcast version. So as always, give a five-star review for the show. We appreciate that. But if you're here on the YouTube channel, make sure you like the video and you subscribe to Blue White Illustrated. Uh, you know, as much as like I focus on football, I don't want this to be just a one note channel. I want us to be able to do more and have cool conversations about basketball and a bunch of other things. So please, when, when we try some new stuff, please support the channel. And that you do that by liking the video and subscribing to Blue White Illustrated. So now that we got that out of the way, uh, Michael Shrewsbury did have more comments, especially challenging his his players. So set up what we're, we're about to hear next. Yeah, it was on on Monday. He he really more or less out of that Purdue game. It, it, sometimes there's a reset, right? When guys are are critical, when coaches are critical of their team and the immediate aftermath of a game, if guys are hot, it's there's competition. It, it brings out that side of coaches naturally. They want to win. Sometimes I would argue, probably a lot of times, they are able to sleep on it reconvene whenever it is the next time they see the media and the tone softens a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the tone did not soften. <laughs> the, the tone did not soften uh, for Micah Shrewsbury uh, when he addressed the media on Monday. Just more mature, right? Like uh, doing what we need him to do in, in certain moments, right? Different games, different moments call for different things. Sometimes it's scoring. Sometimes it's defense. Sometimes it's leadership. Sometimes it's poise. Right? That, that's that's what a senior brings. Right? If you look at a scale of college basketball, right? As a freshman, uh, you want to play. As a sophomore, you want to start. As a junior, you want to be all conference. As a senior, you want to win. And you do whatever it takes to win. That's number one, and it should be number one, you know, on these guys' minds. That is an awesome quote. <laughs> that is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he, he really put it to his seniors. He really put it to those guys to change the trajectory of what was going on because I, I'm not going to say that it was spiraling, at two game, right? You lost two games. You won right. the you won the game on on New Year's Day against Iowa, but you've had two games in a row where I think they had not played to the level of expectation that he has. And and again, like you, you don't want to get carried away by losing to the number one team in the country. You, you right? That that's you can live with that. That that's okay. It's how you play that impacts the perception from him personally how how he's evaluating things and uh certainly what you ended up seeing was monday and tuesday of this week were really uh tension filled i would say i would describe uh it was it was probably not all that pleasant to be a penn state basketball player on monday and tuesday this week yeah um so what do you mean by that? Like, wh- yeah. what, what sort of, how, how does that, how does that work? I, I, I know that this is kind of a basic question, but yeah, what do you mean? Okay. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, one is, and this is, feels kind of gossipy. It, it shouldn't. Uh, I hung out after the media session on Monday, a couple other reporters did too. It's something that happens, right? We were invited to stay and catch a couple of minutes of practice, B roll, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the environment, I would describe it as like the Thunderdome. <laughs> okay. They, they had uh, a specific drill set up where it was literally toss the ball. They, they had lines of offense and lines of defense, three lines, right? Uh, both wings and then somebody in the middle and it was one-on-one basketball. So the, the charge was get a stop, right? Whoever it was one-on-one basketball. And it, you know, you had guys like Mikey Hen and Keba Jai basically wrestling on the floor for the ball. <laughs> you had, you had shouting. I mean, it was, it was intense. It was uh, a, a very competitive challenging type Right, you're you're not just saying like, oh, d- d- execute 
this certain drill. It's, hey, uh, I'm putting you up against another man. Show yeah. me what, like, win, win the rep. Yeah. Uh, and so I, it was, it was, <laughs> it, it was just different. It was different from, I, I think the typical environment that you see at a Penn state basketball practice to the point where we, we were kind of asked to leave maybe a little more abruptly than we normally, you know, typically right. it's a, Hey, okay guys. Like, all right, enough's enough. No, this one was like, Hey, you guys gotta go like right now. Get out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Get out. Uh, uh, it's, it seemed to pay off though. You know, looking at the the next game and, yeah. and some of the things that happened in that game, it was a, it looked like a different team at times. Uh, Penn State yeah. wins eighty five sixty six over Indiana. Your thoughts on that transition? Yeah, I I thought that it, I'll, basically everything that Micah Shrewsbury asked for after the game on Sunday came to fruition. Right, he challenged the want the winning mentality of his seniors yeah. his seniors played extremely well against indiana he challenged the effort overall of, of his team right the the defensive intensity the gritty side of things that they're they're looking for he 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 really put that to the test uh in the locker room he did it with the media he did it in practice you, you name it but all of those things were were called into question and they, they played that way they, they played yeah. one of their better defensive efforts uh, certainly of the Big Ten season, and he, he, right the, calling out the officials, right <laughs> calling out the right. things that they were looking for, ended up it was subtle. I, I'm not sure how many people saw it or were necessarily paying attention to it. I was looking for it, yeah. But some of the touch fouls that Indiana was called for in both the start of both halves. It wasn't just one half. It wasn't just the start of the game. It was the start of both halves. Indiana picked up a couple of those touch fouls on the perimeter. Yeah. And it, it just, it opened the floodgates to a certain extent. They were well, able yeah. to run their action that they were looking for. You you couldn't, if you didn't know it was about the fouls and the change in the type of defense, you saw the result because it was not, like I said, it was night and day ball movement. Guys had space. They were like, it, it just, it looked so different than yeah. it had the last couple games. Yeah, and so it it uh, in a the way that it manifests itself was nine three pointers in the first half, <laughs> nine three pointers in the second half. They had nuts. 18 threes. That ties a program record that they set earlier this year. Uh, right? It was just Seth Lundy had it going, and then mm -hmm. Andrew Funk had it going, and then Andrew Funk kept it going, like bridging the first half and the second half, and Seth Lundy kind of finished it off. Right? It it, it just it was all this you could see the dominoes falling of, yeah. okay, because of this, this is now possible because this is now possible. Uh, Jalen Pickett, who really was kind of quiet in for the first, I would say 30 minutes of the game in, in terms of his scoring that, that opened up for him a little bit. Cam yeah. winter played one of his better games of the season. More so guys right there, got into the about, lane. Like just more, just totally. on itself. More guys were able to access the lane. It wasn't just Pickett you know, driving for two minutes and backing a guy down. It, which is what happens when you're making three pointers. Right. Yep. <laughs> so uh, that, like, but, but it, it does not seem now, now look, there, there were a bunch of guys that played well. Uh, I thought Keva actually had one of his better games and I thought mm -hmm. Evan Mahaffey had an excellent game. He had 12 points. He's fun. He, he is fun. <laughs> yeah, he is fun. Sorry. Well, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to ruin the flow. I just no, got I'm excited. Just, <laughs> I, I, I would just draw attention to the fact that, primarily the seniors were the guys who went off. They popped off yeah. last night. <laughs> they, they, they had a great game. Uh, and I thought that that was, that was a big, a big sentiment that, you know, carried through for Penn state. I just quickly on Mahaffey, he reminds me and I, I got a sense of this early, but it just seeing the way he played yesterday, a little bit of Jamari Wheeler. And I know that like, you know, Penn State basketball fans are spitting at the ground <laughs> yeah. you know, thinking about Jamari Wheeler, but like his, de his defensive uh, disruption and creativity, it's obviously very different because he's that bouncy athletic guy who has lots of length and size, but the intensity, the effort and kind of the crazy, crazy ass plays he can make. And, <laughs> and you know, the speed Jamari had was the way yeah. he did that poking the ball out from behind and jumping in passing lanes and, and being incredibly disruptive is what I saw 
from Mahaffey. Is that is that a fair comparison? Is that a role he can have as this season goes on? Yeah, I think it's a I think it's it, it's an interesting one just because typically people would go body to body, right? Is that's how right. that's the type of players that they compare people to. So I'm intrigued by you going in that direction. But the first word that Micah Shrewsbury used uses to describe Mahaffey is energy. So yeah. if that's the case, if he if he is a ball of energy, and it, it, I mean certainly that fits to what Wheeler did. Um yeah, I, I, I look it, a, a guy who plays tough, a guy who's kind of learning on the fly. He's trying to figure it out out there. You can see it happening in real time. You can see him trying to like get it, mm-hmm. but that's not. Uh, it, it's great when he does get it, but also that's not the only way that he can impact the game. He can just be out there with his presence, with his length, and impact the flow of the game on really yep. both ends of the floor. So I, I, I think that the you know, kind of the setup that we were talking about in October and November about Mahaffey being a guy who given a little bit of runway could kind of force his way into playing time. I, I think you're seeing that. I think that's yeah. something that's definitely coming to fruition uh, at this point in the season. And, we're, and you're only going to see more, right? Is is the more comfort he gets, the, the, the better uh, he feels out there on the floor, the more he understands, the, the more playing time that he's going to get because he does bring it really every time that he's on the floor. Yeah. And it helps out down with the thickness, uh, miles dread down in the paint. Right. So like, he doesn't have to be the only guy down there causing havoc for the other team. Uh, you know, you, you put, I'm stealing your, your thunder here, but trace Jackson Davis did not have a fun day because of the defensive intensity. Yeah. He, I mean, he did, he did some nice things. I thought that he had probably the best game of anybody for Indiana hood. Shafino had a really nice game. Um, in terms of his efficiency at times. And then it kind of, I think it fell off. It really, honestly, like things, things kind of deteriorated. This is not, I, I don't think a great Indiana team and it's reflected in their record. They've they're lost three in a row now. Um, but yeah, Penn state, Penn state took advantage of that. And, and a big part of that was being able to be tough, be, be secure defensively, be strong defensively both in the paint and elsewhere. I uh, I can sense we've got a time limit here, but just quickly, Penn State's through this gambit that we talked about that you outlined at Christmas. So uh, how they do and what comes next? Yeah, at, at three and three in the Big Ten right now, uh, genuinely, and I, they would, would they love more? Would they love to be four and two? Absolutely. Uh, is some of it dictated by the trajectory of the opponents that they're facing? Absolutely. But you, you're going to take it. You're yeah. going to take three and three with an opportunity to get to four and three when they face Wisconsin. They, they have a break. Like that's the, that's the biggest thing right now is they get some time off. They don't play again until next Tuesday night. Um, and, and they've played some of what I would describe as, um, you know, has Illinois had a great start to the season to the big 10 season? No. Has Indiana? No, but Purdue's really good. Michigan state is really on the rise. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michigan has, has played well. And so Penn state is kind of finding itself in where it wants to be, right? Which is the middle of the pack. Just be in the middle of the pack, be in the middle of the pack. And that's going to take you a long way in in the big 10 so be in the upper middle of the pack because we've seen penn state fluctuate between the lower middle of the pack that can fight with everybody every night but ultimately they don't get as many as they want and where they are and it feels where they're going to be with michael shrewsbury's in the upper middle of the pack where it's like okay you're knocking on the ceiling yeah and maybe once in a while you're gonna break through yeah i think i think it's it's kind of interesting because he said on wednesday night how i mean he more or less described feeling as though he was acting in a way that he didn't like, right? He, he, he talked about being so stressed out and every win and loss and everything that happened every day, like dictating his, just, just feeling like he was living on the precipice of like a nervous breakdown almost, right? Like right. Just, just everything was so momentous and important. And guess what? He's not wrong. Like that feeling isn't wrong. Everything that happens in this league dictates 
the next thing that happens, right? right. Is, is you you can't put you can't you cannot afford to put yourself into a deep hole. We've seen this traditionally with Penn State basketball, where Penn State loses a bunch of games and then plays strong down the stretch, but it's always too little, too late. Right. You can't afford to do that. You you have to be able to rebound. You have to be able to avoid lengthy losing streaks. And if you can build yourself a little bit of cushion in the process and, and put together a couple of winning streaks, even better. It, it, it works out much better for you. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's an interesting moment for them right now. Three and three, you're going to take it. You're going to you're going to be, uh, you know, not overjoyed, but you're going to understand that you're very much still a part of the conversation and you can reach, <coughs> excuse me, some of the aspirations that you have for the end of the season. He talked about it. He talked yeah. about it on Wednesday night. He said, we, we plan on playing through the end of March. Well, that'll give us lots of stuff to talk about. Quick recap here, 12 and five overall, three and three in conference. You'll take that, as you said, uh, neutral site, two and one. But of course, the away games, one and two. Uh, and it, that's, you, as you always say, you got to hold serve at home. They're nine and two at home. Uh, they got a couple back. Can they get a couple more? Can they get that momentum going? Any last thoughts as we head into... Uh, you know, as you said, a little bit of a break for Penn State football or ba- basketball. Dang it, I did it. Penn State basketball yeah. here to end the show. Yeah, I think I think that the next two. It, uh, I'm going to say this every podcast. The next two games are really critical. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, when are they? Not? That's what we just said. When are they not? <laughs> you can you can lose at Wisconsin. Penn State is very comfortable losing at Wisconsin. It happens <laughs> all the time and in uh, ugly ways. Weird and in ugly ways. ways, weird ways. They had a one point game last year. It was a. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Last year does not matter. But point being, oh, okay. Forget game planning. I'm just saying. Wisconsin pro- poses challenges, right? Yeah. Then you get Nebraska back at the Bryce Jordan Center, and I-, I genuinely think there should be a crowd for that game. It's a Saturday game at two fifteen in the afternoon, the day after a wrestling match at the Bryce Jordan Center, which is going to bring a lot of people into town. Yep. Uh, on Friday night against Michigan, so combine those two elements and. Penn State has a bunch of Sunday home games. They have three more Sunday Big Ten home games, which is fine. Yeah. But if we're being honest and realistic about what suits people coming into town for the weekend, it, it's Saturday. It's yeah. Saturday afternoon games. It gives you your best chance to bring in a crowd. And certainly I think that they're hoping for it uh, against Nebraska on the 21st of January. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people who are going to be at that game listen to the show. So make sure you say hi to Nate. Make sure when you see him <laughs> up in the uh, in the press row, you give him a wave. Come into the come into town, uh, grab a bite to eat, say hi to Nate. That'll uh, that'll make everyone happy. They'll do it for I'll the hoop around. the hoop show. <laughs> come into a close. We'll be back next week as always. Um, Nate, do you want to set a time? You want to set a date for next week? You want to do this Wednesday after the game? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Wednesday sounds great, actually. So that's going to be how we do this. You got to listen to the show so that, you know, when the next podcast comes out, that's how we're handling it, because basketball changes every week. You know, we can't keep it ne- necessarily as consistent of a schedule as uh, some of our other shows and some of the other rhythms of the show. But we will be coming out on the on Wednesday with the hoop show. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. That is Nate Bauer. Thanks to his kids, by the way, for uh, not coming over and being good children so appreciate them very much very very much we'll talk to you next week on the hoop show